This is Dan Alford with Arc Specialties. When I'm not building robots, I'm building other machines. Today we're going to demonstrate the heat treatment of steel using a machine that I put together for my class at the local community college. Everybody's heard about alchemists. They always tried to take common materials and convert them to gold. Transmutation was the term. Sorry, I can't help you with that. But what I can do is we can quadruple the value of a piece of steel with just a little bit of electricity and a little bit of water. The way we do this is we heat treat it. We can quadruple the strength. And if you quadruple the strength, then you need one-fourth as much steel. It's almost like alchemy. So first question we need to know is why steel? Why is there so much steel used in production? First off, the annual production of steel compared to the other two structural materials is much higher. Why is that? Well, one possible reason is the modulus of elasticity. Steel is much more rigid than titanium or aluminum. Another explanation is tensile strength. With heat treatment, steel is the strongest of the standard structural materials. Another possible is it's cost refined. It's very easy to convert iron ore into steel, much harder with aluminum and titanium. Uh, finally, the cost per pound, which directly relates back to the cost to refine. Steel is around 40 cents a pound. That hasn't changed much in my career. And yet, aluminum and titanium, much higher in cost. So if you put all these things together and combine how easy it is to weld, heat treat, and cut, this is why steel wins. Highest production volumes due to high strength, high modulus elasticity, and low cost. So why is it we can heat treat steel? you have to understand a chemical term called allotropy. This means that a material can exist in more than one physical form at room temperature. One great example of this is carbon. Everybody's familiar with diamonds and graphite. And the difference between the two is simply the formation of the atoms. In the case of the diamonds, it's tetragonal. In the case of the graphite, it's hexagonal. Simply that small difference changes it from an insulator to a conductor, from hard to soft, from expensive to cheap. So let's talk about stacking patterns. How do you stack cannonballs? Do you stack them in triangular patterns, square patterns, or rectangular patterns? In all cases, it's still just cannonballs, but the way you stack them changes the mechanical properties of atoms within a given element. This is an iron carbon phase diagram. Along the x-axis, you have the carbon percentage. On this one, it's uh, zero to about 7%. And along the y-axis, we have temperature. And what it's showing you is that at different temperatures, we have different patterns of stacking of the atoms. And just to make it a little bit easier, we're only going to work in this, this area down here. This is where all the steels are, zero to 2% carbon, probably even less than that. And so we're working uh, in the yellow and the blue zones. And so let's talk about what these two zones are. In the, uh, in the blue zone, that's iron with less than 2% carbon. Iron plus carbon is steel. And that exists as alpha iron, also called ferrite. This is iron below 1340 degrees Fahrenheit. It's body-centered cubic, so we have four atoms on top, four on bottom, one in the center. It has a very low carbon solubility, less than 0.025%. It's magnetic, and it has a relatively low packing density. That means there's a lot of area that's not atoms. It's 0.68 packing density, and that's an important feature. Gamma iron, also called austenite. This is iron above 1,340 degrees Fahrenheit. It's face-centered cubic, which means we have five atoms here, five atoms here, and four in the middle. It can have up to 2% carbon by weight inside the matrix at elevated temperatures. This is non-magnetic and it has a higher packing density. It's 0.74 packing density compared to the 0.68 of alpha iron, 8% more. This is denser. So now that you understand the packing patterns of iron, now let's talk about how you capitalize on this phenomenon to harden steel. This sketch right here is a continuous cooling diagram. So along the left side is temperature. So that's the initial temperature of the steel before we start to cool it. And then along the uh, x-axis is time. And so the faster you cool it, the steeper the line, obviously. And you see these noses. They're, these are transformation lines. So if you cool it very rapidly, 
we form a martensitic structure. If you cool it more slowly, you'll get some bainite and such. And so the whole point of this is, depending on what structure you're trying to achieve, you cool at a different rate. So let's walk through how we're going to harden steel to a martensitic structure. First, you heat steel, which is iron and carbon. And around 1,350 degrees, as I mentioned earlier, steel becomes paramagnetic. Uh, magnets don't stick to it any longer. Uh, it, it goes from body-centered cubic to face-centered cubic. And the solubility of carbon jumps dramatically. It goes from 0.02 to 2%. So all that carbon that was pushed out of the atoms is now back in solution. Then you rapidly cool. You want to cool it faster than the carbon can diffuse back out. So now what you're doing is you're trapping this carbon in the matrix in a super saturated solution of carbon in iron. What you're doing is you're creating another structure. This is a body-centered tetragonal structure, and this is martensite. This is also body-centered cubic, much like the ferrite, except now we have a super saturated solution of carbon in iron. So this one carbon atom distorts the matrix. So instead of a cube, we have a tetrahedron. We have the same four atoms here, four atoms here, and one in the center, but the whole thing is elongated. This stresses the matrix, makes the material harder and stronger. So this slide shows uh, the three different structures. So initially, we have body center cubic, which is ferrite. The carbon is out of solution because it has a very low carbon solubility. We heat it up above 1300 degrees. That's the red line there. We've heated it up to where we've austenitized it. We changed it to that center structure, which is face center cubic, high solubility of carbon. The carbon goes into the matrix, and then you see the red line drops quickly. We're quenching this. We're trapping the carbon, and then you get this third structure, which is the martensitic structure as shown on the right, which is a distorted uh, body-centered cubic, it's called tetragonal. So let's talk about the material that we're actually going to test today, AISI 1090. AISI means American Iron Steel Institute. 1090 is a specification for a plain carbon steel. This is high carbon, and it's used for piano wires and springs, and that's what we're going to run the test on today. If you don't have enough carbon, you can't heat treat, so 0.9 carbon is plenty. That's what the 90 means. If you look there, the 90 means 0.9 carbon, and is that by weight or by volume? I've always found that interesting. It's by weight. And of course, the density of carbon is much lower, so that's a lot of carbon. So uh, even though it's a very low percentage. And so uh, what is that ratio of atoms? I was kind of curious about this. You know, how many atoms are in there? So I did a little math. The atomic mass of iron is 55.8. So if you remember from chemistry, that means that 155.8 moles of atoms per gram. And atomic mass of carbon, much lower at 12, so it's 1 12th moles of atoms per gram. So the ratio of iron to carbon in 1090 steel is 23 to 1. What that means is there's 23 steel atoms, or excuse me, iron atoms for every carbon atom. And I found this kind of interesting because you've seen on my models of the martensitic, there are only nine iron atoms in a tetragonal model. So that means I need one out of nine. And so the explanation for that is there's actually uh, this one carbon is shared with four different cells of tetragonal body-centered cubic martensite. And then it's kind of interesting if you do that from the picture here, I kind of drew it up. Uh, that means you only need one carbon for every 22 iron atoms. That's how it works out. So 1090 steel has just about the right, has a slight surplus uh, of carbon. Pretty interesting. This is a small piece of 4150 steel. The 50 means it's 0.5%, percent one half percent carbon. So this is just you know, a few ounces of steel. How much carbon is in here? So we did the calculations. It works out to 0.3 grams. So what you see right there is all the carbon that's in a piece of steel this big. That small amount of carbon has a dramatic effect on the hardenability of steel. So we've hardened this material. We have a martensitic structure. The only exception to my rule that there's no applications for martensitic structures is razor blades. So other than that, you really need to temper it. And so when you're tempering something, you raise it back up to temperature, but it's below that critical 1325, 1350 degrees Fahrenheit. So you don't transform it back from one structure to another. You're simply 
reducing the stress in the matrix. And so the higher you temper, the more the strong the effect is. So as you increase tempering temperatures, you reduce hardness, you reduce tensile strength, and you reduce the abrasion resistance, but you increase the toughness, you increase the ductility, and you increase the elongation and the reduction of area. So tempering is a necessary step in the heat treating process. This is my portable heat treating demonstration machine. What it is is a phase angle firing circuit controlling a transformer. We're going to resistance heat this wire. This is the 1090 piano wire we mentioned earlier. This magnet right here is on a pendulum, so we can see that right now the wire is magnetic. What we're going to do is turn this thing on, heat the wire. You're going to see it expand, and as it expands, this slide will move down. We're heating the part, and when we want to cool it, we're going to use water. We simply release this wire into the water. So we heat it slowly, cool it quickly. So as we heat this thing up, you're going to see several phenomenon. First is color change. As we heat it up, the wire is going to start to glow red. Uh, the old blacksmiths know that around 1,000 degrees in subdued light, you'll see, start to see red. So now we see red. We're heating higher. Right now the magnet's still sticking to the part. There, the magnet fell away. So we've austenitized the part. We've gone from body-centered cubic to face-centered cubic, and you could tell because the magnet's moved away from the part. So we're going to demonstrate the expansion. What I've done is I've added this rod to magnify the motion of the slide. We're gonna turn it on. As the part grows, it's gonna move down. Numbers don't mean anything, it's just growing longer. Here, let's start it, we'll see how it goes. It's heating, it's expanding, it's expanding. And then at a certain point, it should slow down and actually retract. You see, it actually got smaller. That was the transition from body-centered cubic to face-centered cubic. I told you that it's 8% denser, that's what you saw. Let's turn it off. The same thing should be reversible. Let's let it cool off. Contracting, contracting, contracting. But when it changes back to body-centered cubic, we should see a small expansion right there. It expanded, and now it's contracting again. What you've seen is that difference in volume, the difference in packing efficiency between ferrite, which exists in room temperature, and austenite, which exists at, at higher temperatures. This volume change is what's critical to the hardening of steel. So we're going to heat treat this piano wire. What we're starting with is a wire that's been annealed. That means it's been softened, the opposite of what we're trying to do today. So in this condition, the wire is very soft, very pliable, and there's applications for this. But what we want is something strong and hard. To do that, we need to convert this ferritic structure into a martensitic structure. Here's how we do it. So let's heat treat this part. We'll turn on the machine, running current through the wire, we're heating the wire, we start to see color change. Soon the magnet will fall away. Okay, we are now a body-centered cubic structure. We've heated it. We can leave it at this temperature. Instead, what we want to do is cool it quickly. We're going to use water as a quenching agent. It's that quick. Let's take the part out of the tank, see what we've accomplished. This is the same wire that a minute ago was soft and weak. Now it is hard and brittle. As I said, martensite doesn't have many applications. It's so brittle that there are limited applications for it. What we need to do now is take one of these quenched parts, one of these martensitic parts, and temper it to regain some toughness. So this wire has already been quenched. It's martensitic. This is in the brittle state. We want to temper it, and to do that, we need to heat it back up, but below the critical temperature, below the austenitizing temperature. So heat this up. We'll heat it fairly hot, let's say until we just start to see some color change. Right there, good enough. So that was around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll let it cool. And the rate of cooling at this point is not critical. We could cool it quickly or slowly. We're just going to let it slow cool. Action. So this wire has been quenched, tempered, and so we have what we have is a stronger structure. The wire is much harder, and yet it's no longer brittle. This is the point of heat treatment of steel. Same piece of material, three sets of properties. It can either be soft and weak, hard and brittle, or strong.